Okay, we are live. Um, joining me today, very special guest, Javier gomez Laman. I want to thank you for uh, joining me. Um, so, Javi, for those who don't know you, can you just tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do? Uh, yeah, thanks for inviting me on first, Richard. This is awesome. Uh, I am a... Geez, I guess I'm a philosopher of mind, philosopher of science, X5, former neuroscientist. I'm, doing, I'm going through a lot of transitions here, but I'm starting as a postdoc at the University of Pennsylvania in the philosophy department, working in part with MIRA, which is actually Lisa Marake's group, which looks at issues of philosophy of mind, philosophy of science, and artificial intelligence. So I'm starting in a few weeks. I'm super excited. I just finished my dissertation at CUNY on working memory and consciousness. And yeah, I mean, that's kind of how it feels like at the moment. I'm moving right now, so I you know, <laughs> yeah, apologize exactly. for the sparse wall. <laughs> well, I've been here for a while, and mine's just about as sparse, so there's no need yeah, to no, apologize. Yeah, when he went to the Michelle Kondo, like, you know, spark joy thing, and I like it. <laughs> yeah. So you, you said you had a background in neuroscience. Um, what was that? You did that as an undergrad, or was there a graduate uh, degree involved there? Uh, no. So uh, yeah, I mainly did that. In, uh, so full disclosure, my mother is like an old school electrophysiologist. So oh, okay. there was this kind of, I remember when I was like in first grade, like her version of like, not babysitting, but like, oh, I have to take the kid for an afternoon was take me to the lab. Okay. Like, and she's like perfusing a rat like, with yeah. a heart up there and like taking brain slices. And like, I remember like this is in the old school, like where the oscilloscopes would print out these large sheets of the various uh, wave dynamics of the uh, of voltage clamps that they would use and, you know, on the, on the neurons. And she would make me go with a ruler and I would have to like highlight the peaks, you know? <laughs> so, wow. I just remember the smell of formaldehyde still takes me back. You know? well, yeah, that's old school. <laughs> you know, I, mean, I like to think that, yeah, I mainly did an undergrad, but I, I feel like I have had a lot of experience with it. But in undergrad, I started doing a lot of work on cognitive neuroscience and on um, neuroimaging. So I was really fortunate and I got a grant from the NSF to go for the summer to Carol Seeger's lab at Colorado State, which is an fMRI lab looking at basal ganglia structures and their, how, they, how they work and uh, how, how they might in, instantiate mechanisms related to expectation and learning. And so that was my first real dive into it was I had six weeks to develop a fMRI study and wow. I had a really good team there with Kurt Brownlick and Carol Seeger. And we developed a paradigm looking at whether or not uh, there were different, we, whether or not we could show a differential recruitment of brain structures, depending if you were using categorization rules or not. So we were looking at the differences of memorizing and trying to keep in mind a category versus specific uh, low-level visual features of an object. And that eventually was published in NeuroImage in 2015 or so. But I don't, it was not great, like, but it was really cool to learn how to do it. And it was hard. And I, I have total respect for NeuroImagers. It just made me realize, like, I didn't want to spend all my work week kind of looking over massive matrices of data being like, where is yeah. the signal? You know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I wanted more to just like sit and write those discussion sections. And so I think that's what led me more to gravitate towards this intersection of looking at it more and a theoretical level, like some people might, like Richard Feynman might say, I'm like a janitorial neuroscientist. So I like, I clean up <laughs> people. But I think that there's value in that. I mean, think how bad the world would be. It would be like, I don't know, like Naples during a strike, you know? <laughs> and I think we're at a point where we're excited. A lot of the old guard is changing in philosophy. And we definitely, before we get all excited and just pick up where the neuroscientists are and the money is, that we clean up those concepts. Ooh. Something. Yeah, that's an old school. So you're you're a, pra a practitioner of the uh, handmaiden to science view of philosophy. Is that? I don't necessarily. No, no. I think like it's tough, right? I think when I, I remember being in the lab and there was this really smart kid. He, I can't remember his name. It's like William or something. And he was like doing an MD PhD and like super intense. And I realized like he's a philosopher, he's doing epistemology, he's just doing it badly, <laughs> like, you know? So exactly, they yeah. almost look at it the opposite way. I think scientists are philosophers, they're just doing it sometimes a little bit at a drone level without thinking about, oh man, if I use certain words, and we can get into this later, like activation, yeah. in the way I build my theories, and I'm picking out the word activation from uh, a methodological, like, constraint, like, I 
because I use a certain instrument, then all the problems with that instrument are now baked into your theory. And you have to make sure that you can have a conceptual space and wherewithal to separate those. No, that's absolutely correct. Yeah. No, I've worked in a couple of neuroscience labs as well. Uh, I almost thought I was going to do a, um, a PhD in neuroscience, but I couldn't do the chopping of the rats. That was my downfall. And I didn't really like the, the EEG work. But that's neither here nor there. But I do remember that um, I was in the lab one time and uh, the, the, the PI said, you know, he didn't have any theories. He said, I have no theory. We have no theories here. We're just collecting data. I was like, holy shit, are you kidding? <laughs> like, what? that's all we have are theories. Like, there's a theory here somewhere. The more you yeah. deny it, the more it's dominating probably what's going on. <laughs> so you never got to the level where you were chopping humans? You were comfortable with that, but not the rats? Well, I never chopped humans, no. <laughs> exactly. No, the, the, uh, the worst I did was um, scalp recordings from undergraduates, which was already pretty bad, actually. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> tough, man. But I never got to do fMRI, though, actually. I did, uh, I did ERP, which was... It's funny, yeah, no, definitely. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Oh, no, that's fine. No, but I think you're right. It's, it's really interesting to see, even when I was there in Colorado, within like a few months, how all the mathy modeling stuff, which I was like, oh man, I can't do that. <laughs> like, you know, how that just revamped the way we were doing it in the span of months. Like I remember when I got there, we had to do this so tedious process of you would have the anatomical image. So this high resolution image of somebody's brain. First, you would have to stretch it into a kind of standardized space, the Tallarat space. And then you would have the functional data, which was like much more of a fuzzy cloud. Mm -hmm. And you had to like literally use your own machine learning algorithm, AKA your brain and like map it on perfectly <laughs> in three dimensions. And it took like hours. You would have to do this for every participant. And by the end, people had models and algorithms that would do it. And now I think the biggest advent, the thing that I think I want to flag for philosophers is like, if you're reading an fMRI paper and it doesn't have the words or the letters MVPA or multiple multi-voxel pattern yeah. analysis, you need to stop because it's probably, unless you know exactly what you're doing, you're probably relying on stuff that is basically not null and void, but pretty obsolete. And we have to be very careful when you look and peruse a philosophy to paper and they're citing all this neuroimaging from before maybe 2007 at the earliest, but really 2012, 13, 14. It's you have to take it pretty critically because yeah. it's like the whole univariate model, this idea that, you know, which we go back to, you know, functional dissociations and Penfield going in and like probing people's like sensory motor cortexes and making them move their arms and stuff. Um, that's been nuanced. And I think, you know, there's some people who are very explicit about this. Brad Postel in Wisconsin, I think, does some really good work nuancing this. But a lot of philosophers aren't aware of that division and this idea that like, Yes, we know that the sections of the brain do specific things. So the, you know, fusiform face area, you know, <laughs> tends to light up when we see a face. But we can't be ignorant to the fact that it's not doing it in a little glass vial. It's doing it in the context of this insane structure. Yeah. Stuff is doing all these other things. And really, you have to look at how that brain state together, I don't want to use the word globally, but together constitutes a particular mental state. And I think with the previous techniques where we were subtracting out everything, except the highest signals, we were losing the kind of connections that are really important to create a particular mental state, for instance. Um, and I think that's what you get when you're using stuff like uh, MVPA, you get better resolution as to like, you don't filter out all the, what you thought was excessive information, you get a better picture of just how the brain state itself looks throughout the brain in a given moment. And I think that's really important. And I think that's some cool stuff that uh, I'm excited to see develop where it goes. And I'm excited to see philosophers pay more attention to. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think uh, multivariate pattern analysis is, is one of the most important developments in fMRI. And it, I mean, fMRI studies before, I mean, they're still kind of highly underpowered, but they, they were incredibly underpowered before. Um, and some very dramatic kind of claims were made on the basis of, of this kind of crude method, which before a long time people thought was the most advanced method. Um, that was, you know, that's where you get all the big grant money for. But uh, I think it's important to keep that kind of stuff in mind. Um, my own lab work with, with the animals was, uh, um, um, we're looking at, uh, you know, single cell recordings in, in living animals. So I was, you know, coming from, come from that background, people thought, you know, fMRI, ERP and that stuff was just too wishy-washy. <laughs> the data wasn't good. You want to get in there and record from the actual neurons and, uh, 
um, I think, you know, it's gotten better. So I, I think I think this MVPA is definitely one of the ways in which it's gotten better. So I'm glad you brought that up. Um, that's very interesting. So I didn't realize that about your history. I, I think, you know, it's important that philosophers have this kind of background in the actual sciences that they're um, – that they're interested in philosophizing about. So uh, it's important. Um, now let me ask you, because I know that you're, I mean, um, I want to get to talk about working memory, but one of the things that struck me by reading your work is how much attention you pay to the history of this, uh, mm. of the topic, going back to looking at the way the working memory models have was started and then evolve over time. Um, can you tell us a little bit, I want to ask you about the specifics of it, but before talking about that, can you tell us why do you think that that's important to go through the history uh, of this kind of stuff rather than just talking about where we are now. Totally. I think it's, it actually hangs a little bit on your last point about the, the importance of philosophers, if they're interested in doing a particular science, to get their feet wet. That doesn't mean they have to get a degree necessarily, but there's a sociological component in, in doing the scientific work. I mean, it, you know, I know a lot of people might poo-poo like Helen Longineau and these people who like really take that seriously, but I think if you don't, if you don't have that experience going into a lab, it really is easy to miss Yeah, that, that there is a deep sociological component and things get ossified and the ways articles are written are written for audiences that if you're not aware about the dynamics, just like, you know, how is a scientist supposed to be like, wait, why did he send this to consciousness and cognition and, and not mind? Or like, you know, there's all these dynamics that go in, but if you're not aware of the context, you might miss out what the, 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 the negative space around the article or claim and how that frames it. And I think then you might be willing or tempted to supplant your own and then you might get it wrong. And I think we can talk about this a little bit. I think Carruthers does a really good job at actually bringing a lot of these things to bear that are new and exciting and MVPA in activity, silent working memory. But it's like, it's also being careful about that negative space around it. So to me, the most exciting thing about writing the dissertation or not writing, but, researching it was actually going every library I would go to that I would have time, whether it was when I was teaching at CFC or at Brooklyn college or at, cause the grad center library, let's be honest, is a little, yeah. Um, <laughs> I would go to the old psychology section where they would have the tomes of these like handbooks from the seventies, you know? And that's like, <laughs> I, I, that was like sociologically, like that's how they did it. They would just be like the seventh volume of the handbook of learning and memory, you know, for 1974 and you know they hadn't been open since like 82 <laughs> yeah, nobody's exactly. even looked at it and it smells like that wonderful smell of old books which is probably bad for you and, yeah, and just going and perusing and looking at how the debates about these concepts were on were really a live issue and like realizing that working memory though it's now like battle is god and like yes he's given us the testament from the mount and it is the standard multi-component model <laughs> and if you go to i mean i I was doing this thing when I was writing the dissertation uh, where I was creating like this taxonomy almost, or not even like, an, a, 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 what, do, uh, what do the Aristotelians call it? Like this index locorum of like all the references and all the definitions of working memory. And almost every paper trots out basically the same structure. It's like working memory is this capacity for, to maintain and manipulate limited information over small durations. And, you know, the most standard models, Baudelaire's multi-component model, what's like, whatever. And just, I got 10,000 words of just people just repeating that mantra. And you realize by going into these old books in the seventies, like Baudelaire's is one of many theories that's jostling right. for attention that's jostling for not even dominance but I, if, especially earlier like 74 75 you know people were more talking about broadbent's primary memory they were talking about a whole there's like i remember this one uh i think it's 1976 craig and levi they do this beautiful table that just like goes through 12 different theories of primary memory you know the memory you use short-term memory wherever however they wanted to call it this dissociation from long-term memory and they spend like two paragraphs talking about battle's multi-component model they spend most of the time talking about atkinson and schifrin's model which becomes i think which battle took inspiration from so it's really interesting to go back see these things as live debates allow yourself the conceptual freedom to be like what if they are wrong you know why do you think, I mean, so, I mean, I want to get to the specifics again in a second, but why, sociologically then, what, how did the dominance of Baudelaire come around, do you think? 
What, what actually did people just get tired of debating it? <laughs> what no, happened? No, I think it was, I think, no, I don't think that's the case. It's, it's, it's a good question. I had to like kind of stop myself from going past 76. Um, mainly because I was just trying to show the, how there was a previous model that was used by Badalay and the connection between their two models. I think the reason why Badalay was successful is because Badalay is a really, and, and, um, uh, what's the other guy? Oh my gosh, I can't believe I forget. Hitch. They're really good experimentalists. So they had, and I think we have to sociologically again realize this was still like, if you go to these books, they're like hand drawn graphs, right? And they're trying to be like, we're a real science, you know? <laughs> 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 and, like they have hand drawn artistic renditions. One of my favorite, oh, I wish we could put it up on the screen, is this like hand drawn uh, uh, information processing model of the brain and it literally is like a bunch of boxes some of which are transparent with like an eye at the front of it and like a hand coming out the back and it's just like really nuts <laughs> and it's a beautiful thing but you got to realize i think sociologically psychologists were like we're real scientists and i think the reason why they were successful is because they really were good experimentalists and they showed um this dual task property right so it looked like Rather, if you have a unitary short-term store, then if you're trying to remember, for instance, auditory and um, ver uh, like uh, word cues or number cues, you're trying to keep those visual cues in mind and auditory cues in mind. If you're trying to keep both of them in mind, it should deplete it equally, right? It should right. deplete that, 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 that short-term store equally, and you should be able to see deficits. And the way they tested this is they have this kind of phonological loop mechanism proposed and a visual uh, sketch pad proposed. And they found that actually people could maintain those uh, different modalities of information without it necessarily affecting the other when they were under cognitive load where they would ask them like true-false questions about the stimuli. So they show that there was a kind of modal distinction there where you could keep both visual information in mind and auditory information in mind with it de without it depleting it uh, at, at this kind of general store, as a general store. So I think, and they were able to show this very robustly and reliably, and they gave a good mechanism for it. And I think that's what attracted people to move away from the unitary model. Um, I think the danger with battle is, and it, it is a good uh, proof, I think, that you, know, you can store, it's a kind of proof that I'm attracted to, this idea that, the brain can sort all can maintain all sorts of different representations. They kind of restrict it to two at the beginning, but they give no principal reason why it shouldn't be more. And I think the problem is because they were stuck with this model of these two slave systems. So you can tell it was written by white people. <laughs> these two <laughs> slave systems. Sorry. Okay, no, that's all right. <laughs> Call it what it is. Um, uh, it, you know, it was their model, and they didn't want to change it. So instead, they started adding these special vague things like the central executive and this episodic buffer, which does everything else. And it's just like, you know, you start to lose that the theoretical grasp to, to, to be able to critique. I think once it got, people were happy, they started adopting it. And then it becomes the kind of thing where I remember being in an fMRI lab and wanting to critique this stuff. And they're being like, you can't, that's speculation. You can't put that in the paper. That That's not what our research shows. And I think, you know, there's these, ossified sociological systems that make it so now we're all beginning all our working memory papers, which in fact covers such a huge range of phenomena from olfactory responses, visual responses, motor responses from different methodologies, whether it's EEG, fMRI, oscillatory dynamics, behavioral measures, all this stuff. And we're like, it's all working memory. <laughs> and we have to take a pause and be like, wait, <laughs> maybe that's not the best way to think about it. So Yeah, no, I've definitely heard some well, people, when you make these kind of points, they say, well, isn't it all working memory? It's like, uh, you know, in, in a way that's sort of, I mean, is your thesis, I think, at the end, is that, uh, because I think that you, what you end up with, and maybe we're jumping again, but I want to come back to some of the details in a second, but I think where you end up is that working memory is just a name for cognition in general, a bunch of, a bunch of different ways of keeping information um, relevant and task ready. Uh, so that is just another word for what, what we mean by cognition. Is that, is that, that's the deep worry that like, at least it redescribes. I mean, cognition, again, it, now it depends. Like, are you an embedded embodied person? Or do you think like the ear is doing cognitive work when it's like deflecting sound signals and so forth? But I think, especially when we're interested in like thought and decision making, you know, whatever kind of cognition deals with that, maybe some people call it core or central or higher. Right. You could debate 
why one is better or none are good. Um, but that kind of cognition, I think the problem that we slipped in, that we slipped in at, even earlier than Badele, and it's just been ossified and preserved at the very heart of this construct, is that really working memory just redescribes the phenomenon it's meant to explain, which is how we're able to think and deliberate. And it's very obvious when you even... Like, I remember, I think in Badley's 2001 book, the first line is like, working memory underlies all our ability, all the human uniquely, the uniquely human abilities for complex thought, which again, I have a problem with, but still, you know, it's like, and then, I, you know, what's really funny. I remember I was in uh, Jacobus Vasilius' uh, class on De Anima and just reading the De Anima and reading all the debates on fantasia, this mm -hmm. like mechanism that's supposed to accompany every thought that kind of preserves it, that's essential for memory. And I'm realizing like, this the is same really shit. similar. Yeah, yeah. And so, I, mean, I, I don't want to be like Aristotle discovered working memory, but I want to be like, look, we've been, in terms of our architecture and understanding of the mind, we've been dealing with this for thousands of years. So it's, and it's, it's, it's not a surprise. I'm not saying like bad, bad LA, you embedded. No, I think it's, it's kind of part of our theoretical pre-commitments about how the mind should be. And I think that's what takes, that's what gets scary. It's like, wait a second. How, yeah, I don't want to go folder on it where we're like, we'll never know how the mind works. You know, I don't know. Steven Pinker doesn't know. God, even if God told us, we wouldn't understand. I think, you know, there is some room for not, for optimism, but we do have to even go back to those, you know, pre-assumptions, those intuitions we have about the mind, because I think it's embedded in there that we want this controller, we want this thing that structures our thoughts and our decision space that we can uh, rely on other people having and that we have internally and that grounds thought and decisions and also all those heavier, thicker concepts like rationality and deliberation right. and agency. And I think we have to maybe check ourselves and ask, wait, what do we actually have? What do, what does the research show? And I think right now it shows that, and I think I'm really indebted to the uh, touring and visiting and talking to a lot of people in John Dylan Hayes lab over at Berlin School of Mind and Brain and Charité, um, especially Thomas Christoffel and all these folks over there, because I think they're the ones, you know, in their latest paper in 2017 or so, they're like, we got to restart thinking about this. It looks like the whole brain is capable of maintaining information where it's created. And it's like, yeah, I mean, that's, that's a different model of the mind than we've had before. So anyhow, I know I'm rambling, but no, that's no, it's totally fine. I, I was going to, yeah, I was going to bring that stuff up anyway. The, the, the sort of need to have a, a central place, a central thing that is us or that is the, doer of all the things that we think are important uh, that's that seems to be what's behind a lot of the um the enthusiasm for these sorts of models um so going back to again sort of the more specific stuff so you think that out of all this the two kinds of things which count most like that look most like what they should be called uh, working memory are maintenance and manipulation of information. But then you also think that those things are found ubiquitously in the brain. Like I think you said that in the retina maintains and manipulates information if your argument that maintenance is a kind of manipulation is correct. So uh, I wonder, so first of all, so if we're looking for something that is a natural kind, um, those would be the hallmarks of it. Is that your view? So I don't know. I, I, you know, I've kind of had to, I feel like I use the framework of natural kinds because it was a way for philosophers to get their teeth, you know, to whet their appetite and kind of figure out this, this, this concept. And I, I feel like as I go forward, I want to rely less and less on that. And I want to motivate philosophers because I feel like it, it, there's a lot people, philosophers have a lot of hangups with that. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to realize, like, even if it's not a natural kind, whatever that is, and I use the most, I call it the most congenial theory, Khalidi's theory, where, like, you know, you have a very yeah. slow bar <laughs> for what counts. So but I think, like, look, it, an espresso is a non-natural kind, but it's still important. We can still talk about it. We can still theorize about it. So that doesn't, I don't know, I feel like we have too many hangups about why that's an important thing. We, we pack too much into it. So I, beyond that, I guess what I'm saying is, I think when you look at the literature, when you look at the way people operationalize what this capacity to hold things in mind and to, that's important for thought actually should do is that it should, and this is just, I, this is like this taxonomy I built of 10,000 words of, I think, something like 
210 definitions and almost, I would say, 80% of them had maintenance or manipulation in some way built into it. And I think if you go back, you see this even with like Atkinson and Schifrin's model, which is the first real model of working memory, this unitary model, which is very beautiful. It's like they have stimulus coming in, then it goes through the stimulus registers, like haptic, visual, et cetera. Then it can either stop or it can go through this temporary workspace they call working memory, in which case it could be maintained through rehearsal or you can do stuff with it so you can manipulate it. And then either it gets, you, you either behave based on that information or it gets encoded into long-term memory. And I think it's just at the core of the concept as it's been operationalized in science and psychology over the last 50 years that maintenance and manipulation are the key pillars of it. The problem is, I think there's not, there's some, uh, there's some efforts to do this kind of task dependency. So like maybe we can cash out what maintenance is by giving it a kind of specific task profile or ma manipulation especially. But I feel like in general, people haven't spent enough time thinking conceptually about like, why it may even be the case that those two things are separable. Like, isn't it, you know, doing the philosophy thing for a second, isn't it the case that maintenance, like this, if it's not just a static thing, which even at the beginning in Atkinson's model, they assume that it's, it's not a static, like, image that's retained in the brain. It's an actual rehearsal process. It's an right. active thing that disappears and comes back, disappears and comes back. And, you know, this has been shown in terms of like how the oscillatory dynamics work, but also things like an activity silent working memory states, which I want to talk about later, but it's an active process. And so unless you're making this kind of weird ad hoc or post hoc divisions between the two, you need a kind of conceptual reason why thinking that maintenance isn't itself a kind of manipulation. Um, and I don't even think that kind of work has been done. And I think that what, if we're also finding these terms in, and I think activity is another one, like active maintenance and what that means. Right. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're like basically betting and committing ourselves to a framework that might not be the best empir to, to, to base empirical investigations on and philosophical uh, discussions on. So uh, that's, that's interesting, but I wonder, so, I mean, I think active maintenance is probably the way that I would be tended to tempted to characterize what I think is right about the intuitions behind working memory that you're actively maintaining the information. Um, what is it about the active maintenance that entails manipulation? It's just that, is it just that you're doing something with it when you rehearse it? So if you just take the classic case of remembering a, a number, you know, you can repeat it over and over your head, over and over in your head, trying to remember the, the series of digits or whatever, how is that manipulation on your view? Or how is that something that we would think of as manipulation? So I think we need to figure out what, what, what the desiderata for something to be manipulated is, right? So if it's an actual change in the contents, right, then I think we can start theorizing a little bit about how that might be different. But the thing is that if it's, a, so assume that you have some representation that you're trying to keep in mind, like a representation of an apple or just, you know, we could go with A and B, like whatever, A. Mm -hmm. And you want to manipulate that by adding, because you've learned something else or you have some background knowledge about it, you want it to be like A prime. And so the question is, what are the, what are the kind of abstract processes that might be involved in that that, that journey from A to A prime, is it the case that you, there is a mechanism there that sticks the prime onto the A? Is there like an actual uh, mechanism that changes that representation? And if so, I think that's very interesting. And we might have to talk about that as a separable system. But my intuition is that that's going to be very dependent on modality specifics and modality dynamics. It probably isn't going to be one universalizing mechanism that does that. But even so, in the process of remembering, in the process of memory, now let's say we have whatever magical system turn, turned it from A to A prime. Now we're trying to remember that. So in some sense, maintenance is built into the prospects of, of manipulation almost as a necessary condition. So I think seeing them as separable in a strict sense without postulating like what we want maintenance to accomplish minimally is a bit dangerous. So I think it's not so much that I'm thinking every instance of maintenance is going to be, I don't, I think if anything, manipulation of a, of a minimal sort is a kind of a fundamental property of the brain. Insofar as like, I call it at one point, like a currency of cognition. Mm. I think we're going to see it 
everywhere because it's just some a product of physical systems. Like that's just a bare bones, like you know, kind of relational property that exists in the world that other systems can take advantage of. And I think is an important relational property for how the brain works. And so we're going to see it everywhere. If we want to then derive specific manipulations, we need to realize that that might be this whole separable class of processes that's going to be modality dependent, that's going to be very distinct, that's going to be very important for us understanding how the brain actually processes information, but we can't necessarily see it in the simple binary framework. So. I don't so, know. That probably doesn't make it easier. But. It doesn't make it yeah. <laughs> But I'm wondering, so what would you say if you wanted to add things like um, resist distraction or something like that? So what if, you know, sometimes you hear working memory described in these terms that you keep information online and you can resist distractors and then, you know, answer a question about it later or something like that. that so those kinds of things aren't going to help uh, adding to the, the definition to make it something that's interesting. So it's not that it's not interesting. I think so uh, in one way, but not in another. So I think uh, the more kind of operationalized terms that you add on to this whatever view of working memory, so let's call it more, you know, the specific more narrow view of working memory, the more like caveats and task dependent properties that you add on, of course, you're going to find something that does it. And you're going to find some people that are better than others, and you're going to be able to say, these brain regions seem to support it. But then you're not going to be able to come back around and say, okay, so we found the key. Net Just because you found something that's task sensitive, that works with all these operationalizations, it's not uh, a clear foregone conclusion that that thing's supporting the general properties that we've already associated with working memory of thought and decision making, right? So it's almost like we have two choices. Either we can separate it and become narrow and and drive down and call working memory just one of the many ways we can maintain and manipulate information however we decide to it has to be so and so robust so and so you know it has to be four chunks it has to be at least four seconds it's got to be such and such robustness and it's got to you know it's got to have this dynamic i'm sure you're going to find that uh, it does exist i'm just not going to be convinced that that's a uniquely unified separable system of the brain that itself is important in how that itself is fundamental in the same way that we've discovered in your experiments in the way we think and reason and, and decide things. I think we have two choices here. We can either say, yeah, there are going to be so many mechanisms and ways in, in the brain and they're going to attach and combine together in innovative and different ways to allow us to do things like remember things with distractors present, but that might not itself underlie or be the key to solving general problems of cognition or thought. Right. So it's either going to be so specific that it's kind of uninterestingly general, it's non-generalizable, or it's going to be this other thing that's just more general. And so also not interesting for helping us theorize about the nature of the mind. Non-explanatory. And, non and, I, and I think that's, I think it's what I would like people to, take away from this is yes, maintenance and manipulation are important, but they're going to be instantiated in all sorts of different ways. We have to be sensitive to the conceptual distinctions at play. And I'm not saying I solved it, but I'm saying like, look, I just want to show that, you know, at least from a base, like simple philosophical level, it's not clear a priori why these things should be distinct, especially if we have this notion of active maintenance, because it, you know, it might be the case that when we actively maintain something, it's like, you know, not to get into occasionalism and Descartes, but it's like, is it, is it a new representation every time? Is it the same representation? Is that a silly way to even think about it? But in some sense, I think we need to do some of that work and realize that there's going to be really a lot of mechanisms that support these, 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 these are probably not going to be natural kind terms in themselves. Wow. They're going to be too generalizable and we're going to have to break them down in ways that are way more tractable to the fact that there's going to be a whole host of modality sensitive components that are doing all of these uh, operations that are, that the brain does and that's okay. You know? So um, you're not a skeptic about, um, about the other normal candidates for memory, like long-term, short-term memory. You're, I mean, you're not, you're, I, or does the skepticism extend to those guys or not? A little bit. I think, I mean, I'm a skeptic of the ways, you know, I almost feel like, and this is, you know, probably more, a fault of my own vanity and pride, but <laughs> like 
it's it's kind of like theoretical physics before uh, punk. And I'm not saying I'm punk, but it's just like, you know, we're like, we got it. This is easy. We're done. Like, you know. <laughs> yeah. And I have to remind everybody, you know, there was this amazing lecture when I was in neuroscience 101. The guy was terrible. I'm not going to mention his name. But he worked on, like, crab anatomy. And he, like, showed a diagram of, like, the 32 neurons that control the max, the jaws of the crab and how they mapped on every dendrite, every synapse, every connection, every neurotransmitter phase change. Like, and they still couldn't successfully model it. And it's because they didn't take the context of the glial cells involved. And, you know, these things, this is 32 neurons. That's yeah. Cool. And we can't <laughs> we can get it. And so it's more just I want to urge a bit of conceptual flexibility that I think is going to be very important, but also the idea like, of course we can do all these things. We can think, we can reason, we can deliberate, we can remember things, we can remember things at different time scales, but it might be a spectrum of processes that's involved in this and at many different levels. And I think as long as we don't commit ourselves prematurely to an ontology that isn't flexible, uh, or I guess if we do do that, that's bad, basically. And so we just need to have an ontology that is more flexible and sensitive to the fact that maintenance and manipulation, I mean, those things probably exist in all sorts of forms all over the nervous system because it's just how information gets processed minimally in a biologically realized system. Um, so, sure, they're the cornerstones of working memory, but they're the cornerstones of long-term memory. They're going to be the cornerstones of, like, the, how you get the mock band illusion in the in the neuron and i mean in the retina you know, like it's it's going to be you're going to find those properties throughout so there it's more about the second order properties that derive from the specific mechanisms that we might track for example how does the mock band illusion work oh it turns out it's this lateral inhibition of 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 your of of, of the cells in the retina that are causing these kinds of edge contrast changes and that's a good explanation and that's a second order it doesn't mean that all maintenance is lateral inhibition right right it's like there's many ways to instantiate this and i think really opening ourselves up to that and i think neuroscientists know this i mean every time i have this talk neuroscientists are like we know that working memory isn't like a real thing or not a real <laughs> thing. we know it's this much broader thing and you know it's funny you read a working memory article and you to me you just go to the second paragraph because that's really what they're testing they're looking at like <laughs> saliency maps in motor cortex. It's like, cool, that's awesome. Let's do that. That's cool stuff. You know, or they're looking at beta wave, uh, beta, fra beta phase synchrony in oscillatory dynamics during tactile responses. That's cool. Let's do that. But to shove them all into one thing is... I think uh, I'm well. That's how you get grants. <laughs> I, again, sociology is important. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, you got to talk that stuff up. So, um, so given, I mean, I, I I find your kind of considerations very convincing. At, at least um, the the dash of cold water is very refreshing. Uh, so, um, what what practical implications do you think that this has for like theories of consciousness? So I know that you go through pretty much all the major theories of consciousness and say that they have problems with this, but it just it generally, and in particular, if you want to talk about specific ones, what do you think the, the issues are with those theories and um, their reliance on working memory? Well, I would say first order theories. I, I can't do all of them, right? So yeah. really, I think first order theories are the ones that are particularly, and I don't know, we should talk about this a bit because I know that, you know, uh, coming from the CUNY hive mind and having higher order thoughts flowing around there, there there's like a, Maybe they also involve working memory, but maybe they take care of it in a more nuanced way. I'd like to think more about that. So I really focus just on first order theories because I think they're the most, again, this is very vain, but I want to disabuse philosophers of a reliance on terms themselves that are potential black boxes as they build yeah. their theories. And I think the philosophers most at risk for this are people who are committed to kind of first order theories of consciousness. So that is to say these naturalistic minimalistic neuronal or cognitive theory. So people like DeHaan and Global Workspace, uh, people like Carruthers and Global... I mean, Global Workspace is basically the name of the game. Of course, there's a few other ones like Jesse's Air Theory, which I think is also just Global Workspace. But, um, I think they're, they're the most at risk. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting because they all... So just to give three examples and then one counter... Jesse's air theory, you know, uh, basically says you're conscious when you have an attended intermediate level representation that's made available to working memory. So working memory is a structural component of that theory. Then you have people like um, DeHaan um, 
and uh, Carruthers, well, let's start with the hand who says stuff like, or let's start with Carruthers actually, because he thinks that working memory is this workspace of the mind that actually instantiates the global, it is identical to this thing that's a global workspace. And to be conscious, it has to go through, uh, or at least the contents of working memory are going to be necessarily conscious. I know, you know, it's not the super strict claim, but it is somewhere in that ballpark. And then you have people like DeHan who are much more careful. They're like, wait, no, no, no. Working memory is a separable thing because I know I'll get yelled at by my friends down the hall. <laughs> but the way they describe their, the, the, the function, the localization, and the um, – well, basically the function, the, the where and the how and the whys of, of the global workspace is – pretty damn close to working memory. And so, and it's weird, especially to see them try to wiggle their way out of it. But if you put pressure on that, it becomes very obvious that either you have two things that do basically the same thing, or they're really talking about the same thing. And, you know, the just basic fundamental parsimony requires us to take it seriously that working memory is an active component in their view of the workspace. And again, there, there, there's some, there's some fiddliness there. I mean, they do talk about consciousness being global and they don't want to commit to it being in a particular area. Uh, but at the same time, it's, it's necessary. You have, it's necessary to maintain information and maintaining information is a byproduct of consciousness. Consciousness is a is the workspace is generally realized by these frontal parietal uh, neurons that have long axons and, and send messages to each other or innervate the brain. That is to say, and, and, and when you really put pressure on it, either they have to accept that there are two weird things that do very similar things, or really it's it's one general system. And because I think working memory packs in so much, because, and this is, again, from this Kreck and Livy review in 1976, when they're talking about Atkinson and Schifrin's model, they say, Atkinson and Schifrin's model, this isn't this kind of where, you know, you have sensory buffers, and then you have this temporary workspace, and then you have behavior. But, like, the temporary workspace is not this uh, kind of platform for learning. It, 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 it's all of cognition. Yeah. Um, that's been baked in and priced into working memory in various ways so people have been more careful about it. And so if you're committed to the view that consciousness is dependent robustly on this thing called working memory, and if you don't really specify how working memory doesn't just redescribe most robust cognitive acts, then you're just saying consciousness just is a byproduct of cognition, which is seems trivial in some sense for a materialist. And so it's not explanatory. And I think if we want to actually convince people like Chalmers or anybody, it needs to be explanatory at the very minimal uh, uh, case. So that's why I take particular, tar I target those people because I think they've already made the, the mistake to some degree by pricing in working memory into their models. And then Lame is another one that's slightly different or Lama, um, because, well, he's just, it's just nuts, right? But it's cool. <laughs> he's, 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 he's saying like, hey, it's this minimal recurrent processing. It could be anywhere. Sorry, I don't yeah. think that's a hard problem. But it's cool because <laughs> it's not working memory. And I'm like, oh, that's exciting. <laughs> <laughs> so, that, I mean, you brought up a lot of interesting things there. But I wonder, so, uh, to, to sort of hone in on some of the stuff you just said. So, if Jesse, um, hit, you know, attention makes these things available to working memory, you object working memories got to be fleshed out more and it's not done or whatever. Uh, it's not a real thing in some sense. That's important. What, and if, if Jesse just switched and said, okay, attention makes these representations available to cognition, which really is what you think his view says. If he explicitly said that, then you would say your theory is not explanatory anymore. But I wonder what's been lost uh, um, I don't want to defend Jesse's view. I'm not a, a big fan of it, but I think it's worked out in enough detail that we can ask these kind of questions because uh, most of what's going on there, I mean, I mean, I, I've talked to people who say he doesn't even need to use the word attention. Really, you know, it's these certain kinds of oscillations, these frequencies and 40 hertz, they get entrained, the information is broadcast to another area, it happens to be in the prefrontal cortex. Um, so whether it's called attention or whether it's called working memory, why does that, in your view, why does that drive the explanatory value of the theory? That's a really good point. Um, so I'm wrong. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> so I think I need to be a little more sensitive. The, the, the critique of Jesse, I mean, there's a reason why it's 60 pages. Because yeah, that's long. It, it's, 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 ah, I mean, I love Jesse. He's my advisor. But 
he's very careful and really pinning him down takes a lot of work. So yeah. just to make a long story short, I think it, it wouldn't make too much of a difference because the problem I think is more in this two things. One is the specifics of what constitutes the right kind of, of attention, like what constitutes attention for him isn't this generic thing, right? It's a very, very specific thing. It's basically gamma band modulate, you know, it's vector waves that are modulated by gamma band activation in the right way. And there's this key point where like he sneaks it in three or four times in a theory. And in the right way means it has to be controlled by the right structures. Yeah. It has to be, and at one point he even says it has to be controlled by these central structures, these central brain structures. So it's not just any vector wave modulated by gamma band oscillation, because then he would commit himself to all these cases where we can find that and it doesn't exist. Like, look, we have gamma band oscillations when we sleep right. all the time. It's, it's an amazing amount of work. If you look into it, there's all this like very clever work showing that gamma band light maintenance, because again, this might just be a realizer, or one of the realizers of maintenance, is everywhere. It's just a generic property of the brain that it uses along with other properties to calculate and, and, and actually process information. And that's not surprising. Um, so he has to hone it in, and he's aware of that because he's Jesse, he's smart. And so he hones it in. The problem is in the vagueness by saying it has to be controlled in the right way by the right structure. So then you have to ask yourself, okay, well, what are these right structures? What are the functions of them? And, and basically he can go two ways, and he can either say they're not the same structures as working memory or they are. If they're not the same structures as working memory, then you have two central kinds of brain structures. You have the working memory ones, and then you have these other magical ones. And then he gets into conflicts about explaining just the rest of his theory in terms of availability and all these other properties that I'll get into in just a second. If they are the same structures, then it turns out that working memory doesn't just sit around passively being like, oh, I'm just available. It actually engenders the right kind of attention. So working memory then engenders consciousness. And that's just, that is something that he's committed to not saying for very many reasons. And one of it is because he doesn't want to give a weird dispositionless account of availability. Right. So, right, it can't be this like, oh, Mysterian state where you have this vector wave, it's modulated in just the right way. And what makes it conscious is that it could in the future be used by working memory, right? That's just like a weird, and I think uh, Burge has very good critiques of this already about like why a dispositional cognitive view is not, not, not tenable. Um, so he doesn't. He says to be available is, ju is just to be modulated in the right way. So it's it's this, it is a kind of dispositionalism, but at the at the level of the modulation. Right. So so it's actually you know it's more like to be available to working memory just means that it has to be modulated in the right way. But that modulation in the right way is actually controlled by working memory. So now it just starts to conflate into one kind of working memory is doing all of the robust work and he can't really keep up all the divisions he needs in order to not make it just a variant of global workspace, including this non-centrality desideratum and non-locality desiderata. Um, and but it still would be, I mean, so not to cut you off too quickly, and I want to hear the rest of your thought, but it still would be um, distinct from at least some versions of global workspace theory because they think that these, things, these states need to be sort of re-encoded in the, in the uh, higher level I mean, what they would call working memory. Um, and where Jesse doesn't think that, he thinks they don't need to actually be encoded there. So isn't, that's a pretty big distinction. So I guess it would mean two things. Perhaps there might be some wiggle room there. I don't even think that the, I don't, I'm not necessarily convinced about the re-encoding story on Global Workspace View. Uh, I think, but beyond, before we get to that point, I think with Jesse's view, it, it's the case that if working memory, if making a given, a, uh, uh, air representation available to working memory is just it being modulated in the right way and being modulated in the right way just means that it is basically under the control of working memory however that looks like then in some sense there has to be I wouldn't say I don't know if it's a re-encoding but there is an effect of working memory actually communicating with the structure and creating top-down signals onto it to amplify it maybe to amplify it so that it can actually be accessible to other consumer systems. And I think once you get more of that story involved, you see that there's actually, it's, it's it, maybe it's not identical to, but it's a short stride away from uh, something like a more minimal global workspace theory where with global workspace, again, and I, 
I challenge the theorists to be a little more cautious about how they use the different terms between grad broadcasting and maintaining in the workspace. I think these are thrown around in a very messy way. That's yeah. very difficult, makes it very difficult to give a charitable critique of them. But I think when you have global workspace, you have, you know, the, the generic bars view where you have this representation and um, what happens is it, it's able to be broadcast by a given system so that all these consumer systems can can see it kind of like the school teacher putting something up on the blackboard then all the children at their desk kind of work on whatever it is that they need to and then some of them might go hey i have the answer and yeah. shout back out so i mean in some sense yes there's there's differences but i think it's within the family and i even jesse kind of makes this like makes a kind of quip at some point in his uh in his uh um in his book later on where he's like, it is a kind of global workspace, but one that's non-central. Right. That's the key difference for him that he sees between himself and DeHaan. And the non-centrality means that it's not controlled by these special workspace areas, that it just can be available to them. And he's trying to give the whole explanation of how the the broadcasting and the and and and, and the not only the broadcasting, but the attentional modulation that then begins the broadcasting, he wants to put that into one component on the kind of supplier side rather than having it on the uh, central side. And I think the problem is he can't maintain that unless he explains the relationship between these supposedly important central brain structures and the, the vector wave or the representation that's actually attentionally modulated. So, I mean, there's nuances in both. And I think it's one thing that people haven't, given Jesse enough credit is to really work through carefully his view of attention, which is weird and probably shouldn't be called attention. Right. Yeah. No, that's something I've heard before is that people wonder why does he call this attention? It <laughs> doesn't look like what a, other people are talking about. Yeah. Um, so, so if, 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 if he agreed with your critique of working memory and recast this theory without it, then you think the same problems will result. So it doesn't, I mean, what, what I'm getting from you is, is it sounds like it's not really a problem with working memory so much as that it's a problem with the way that he thinks whatever control structures are modulating this signal um, is going to collapse it into just a version of other kinds of theories. But I'm not hearing a challenge, which I thought was the beginning challenge, which was a challenge to the explanatoriness the, yeah, the, so uh, to the theory. No, I think you're right. So there's, I think I approach Jesse's view more critically in terms of this kind of nitpickiness about it being internally consistent. Mm -hmm. I don't think it is. And I think that's because it's so close to being like a cool, like, whoa, maybe he's given us this mechanistic real view that we can test about consciousness. And then it just gives it away at the very end by adding this vagueness and these central components, which I think there is an explanatory problem there, namely that if the central components are the same as working memory, and if working memory is just cognition, then it's just kind of not saying anything interesting. But you're right, this is almost a notational variant at that point. Like, there's a separate critique of being like, look, if, it, if consciousness is just engendered by cognition, what does that tell us uh, explanatorily? I mean, nothing more than if we say it's engendered by working memory. Right. I, they're, they're, I mean, I, could, I, and I think that... It's just more like unveiling, you know revealing like what we're actually saying when we think we're saying something explanatory by substituting a scientifically vetted concept like working memory in place of cognition. Yes, right. And I mean, you know, going back to Bernie and you mentioned his aversion of before, he certainly, you know, his book was called The Cognitive Theory of Consciousness. <laughs> that's, that's what he thought he was doing. It's just that what they took cognition, to, the relevant cognition to be was working memory. So now that's kind of taken off. But I think the real insight that those guys had was that consciousness is cognitive. It's somehow cognitively constructed or built up um, uh, by the cognitive system. So I'm just wondering, you know, if you convinced all these people that there are these problems with working memory, um, what would they lose uh, besides the term? I mean, the, the, the structures that they think are there, the dynamics that they think are there are still there and they still might uh, play the role um, and it still would be cognition and they still would have a cognitive theory of consciousness. So I, I just wonder what would be so devastating to the theories if they, were, if they adopted your view. Right. So, I mean, if they just substituted, I guess, so it, but we need to be a bit careful here, I think, because I think we're giving them a little bit too much credit. I think okay. <laughs> yeah. 
by giving a cognitive theory of consciousness is that they can decompose it into like these relatively testable modules and and that they, they can show that the communication between the modules is what's making it happen. And I think the way they do that is by a reliance on this kind of thing of working memory uh, as one of the key pr components in order to uh, actually give an explanation of how things are controlled and how things are maintained and how things are manipulated in the brain. Now, the problem is if you get rid of those components, if you say, look, in fact, those components don't actually describe it, because I think I'm willing, I'm buying everything until you say like, look, the components and structures are still the same. It's like, no, it's like, that's kind of the problem. When we blow up working memory, we're not just saying, oh, just replace the term uh, with consciousness and retain the central executive, retain the phonological loop, retain this kind of frontal parietal model where representations are taken from sensory systems and like ferried over to this protective place where they're maintained and where we can use it as this work space where thoughts from across the cognitive economy can come together like a blackboard that we can combine in interesting ways i think no uh, stop no <laughs> like it's 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 not only that explanatorily it's basically just saying cognition but it's more like the 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 the, the boxology that they've come up with is flawed right so it's a deeper level of critique i think because once you it's not just like working memory just means cognition and everything's fine we can change all the words it's more like the way, the reason why working memory means cognition is because these structures don't actually, uh, they, 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 I'm, it's not that they don't exist. We can clearly do the tasks that people want us to do, but I don't think that we do the tasks that people want us to do because we have a dedicated, unique, and very specif and, and specified kind of realizer of this boxology in the brain. I think it's because it just so happens the brain's the kind of thing that can maintain and manipulate, and we can combine it and those various structures and mechanisms that are maintaining and manipulating in the right way to perform a task. I mean, that's kind of what the brain does. So it's, wow. it's not surprising to me that we can do these things. It's just surprising to me when people say, ah, my operationalized task dependent version clearly unveils a central structure that is the thing that grounds thought and decision-making cognition. It's like, ah, no. Right. You know, because I think, we have to take a step back and realize, no, 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 no. Like the whole, all these, all these mechanisms and, and systems and subsystems that are probably responsible for maintaining and manipulating all the ways that we have thought of and haven't thought of. So this is kind of where I want to flag activity silent stuff uh, to talk about in a moment, because I think that's been a big surprising thing philosophers have to pay attention to too. When we see all these components, uh, it, it, there's a huge diversity and of, of ways that the brain might be able to perform a task. And it might not be the same between you and me. It might be something that changes over the lifespan, over enculturation practices. It might be something that's actually much more socially embedded than we expected before. And so, yeah, it's not just like working memory, just substitute the term for cognition and everything's fine. It's like the boxologies that these theories depend on in order to give the explanatory weight of how these systems interact or communicate in order to produce a phenomena at hand, consciousness, that ain't true. <laughs> right, I see. Uh -huh. So are, are you a, a skeptic in general of any boxology or any correct theory of how cognition works or not to get it, go off order again because you said you didn't want to, but it sounds like you're, I mean, you're leaning towards a pretty hardcore kind of skepticism that no theory is going to capture? I don't know if it's an in-principle skepticism. I think it's more like a, man, I, I've fallen off the camel and I've seen the light a little bit. <laughs> like, really, when you put things to the test, it's like, these aren't satisfactory. I'm, I'm actually, I, I used to think that all boxologies were horrible. I, I have this one slide where I show, like, the original 1970s boxology, which has, like, the eye of, like, a hand artistic drawn eye that's sticking out of the box and a hand that's sticking out of the box as well. And I show the progression over 50 years and to the boxologies of today where it's like, Oh my God, it's one of Hashi's PFC version. Yeah. It's ridiculous. Uh, it's like, <laughs> you know, it's like, this is what's going on. This doesn't explain anything. And I went on the Craver bandwagon of being like, no, it's ontologically different. We need mechanisms and realizers and components. But I, recently I just saw, and I, re I can't remember her name, but she's amazing. She's a student of Michael Pollan's gave a really good talk in Berlin where she tried to show that the face recognition boxology could map onto some of 
the explanatory desiderata of mechanistic theories. So I'm willing to like stop for a second and be like, well, maybe some will help and be worthwhile. I think the current kinds of boxologies, it's, it's just like, it's amazing. I think uh, Cohen's one, which is really spectacular. He's like, here's working memory. And it shows this vague blob. And this is like your entire repository of knowledge, right? <laughs> okay. There's a little circle outside the blob and it's the central executive. And then it beams down onto the blob and creates a spotlight <laughs> of attention. And that's working memory. And I'm just like, <laughs> no, <laughs> like this is an explanatory. So it's not a deep pessimism. I just want us to check ourselves and be like, wait a second. Do we, what do we want with the theory of cognition? What exactly, what kind of concepts are crucial to it? How might we actually, given the way that the brain is not this von Neumann machine, right. it's not a, this kind of, it might not even be a Joycean machine. It is, a, it's a weird freaking kind of little machine learning thing with like all these different networks that we're just beginning to crack open. So we need to give ourselves a conceptual flexibility to be like, wow, there might be many components that are involved in thought obviously. And they also might not be identical between people, between creatures, between all. And th that's okay. There might be different ways to realize it from the components that we have. And I think coming up with more flexible theories. So I, I, I remember seeing this beautiful set of studies by Curtis Clay. It's like his lab for the last five years, including one by Jurda in 2012, where they do a bunch of um, MVPA studies where they show that they do some very, very, very clever uh, minimal paradigms, as I like to call them, where minimally they're just trying to get people to remember a location of a given object or to covertly attend to the previous location of a given object, overtly attend to the location of a given object, or make a plan to make a motor saccade between like a, 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 an eye movement between uh, various objects, right? And what's very cool is like these things have different conceptualizations, right? So one's memory, one's attention, one's covert attention, one's motor preparation or motor intention, as the psychologists call it with a T. Right. Um, <laughs> and what they found is like, oh, it turns out if they train a classifier, so if they train, you know, this uh, algorithm, a uh, very simple algorithm on the results from one, it can exactly predict the, 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 the kinds of dynamics that are going to happen in the regions recruited on all the other ones. So it turns out there's just like, you know, the brain is flexible and it's not seeing these conceptual divisions, right? It's using very similar mechanisms to deal with all of these problems. And, I, and we need to even take a step back. I think I'll, I'll let you, I'll, I'll stop it just a second. But, you know, there was this moment a long, long time ago where I was talking to David Jench, who's a neuroscientist. He was at UCLA does like really hardcore electrophysiology on monkeys. So like hardcore stuff, right? Yeah. Um, and he was like, working memory is stupid. And I was like, what do you mean? And he's like, well, think about it. Every single psychological study has you remember these cues and instructions in order to successfully perform the study. So you're always doing maintenance and manipulation of active information in order to be successful in the task. So how can they ever like ferret that out? How can they ever subtract it out of the thing if it's implicit in every freaking psychological study we have? It's there even in studies where we're not looking for it. So it's not surprising that we're getting this like, oh look, there's this same structure that's popping up over and over and over. It's like, because part of the task demands of all these studies are the same. So anyhow, <laughs> yeah, that's a, I've, fallen that's... The, I've fallen off the camel. I've seen the light. I, I don't want to be Fodor. I want us to pay attention to the dynamics that, that could exist, realize that these terms need, we need better cooperation between philosophers and psychologists to actually come up with real empirically testable, like this is a challenge almost. Like we need to come up with ways, like how can we actually test the maintenance here or not? What would that look like? You know? Right. No, and that's important work. Um, so you, you've been talking a few times, you've mentioned activity silence, working memory, and I want to make sure that we have a chance to discuss that because I think that's incredibly important and exciting stuff. Um, uh, I, I guess I have recently sort of found reason to be a little bit skeptical of that. So I wonder what you think about uh, some of this work coming out of it. was actually by, from DeHan's lab, I think, uh, uh, basically what, what they suggested, what they, what they basically uh, think they found was that 
it's not, I mean, as soon as you try to use it, it's not silent anymore. So that the idea that there's maintenance or manipulation in activity silent networks is a little bit far. I mean, th just pretty theoretically, it seems kind of far-fetched that you can manipulate information without having any activity going on, which is what activity silent is. Holy <laughs> yeah, it seems crazy when you think about it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Like philosophers, and we need to like be like, what would Aristotle say? You know, to some degree, uh, because I think it is nuts. The word it's an oxymoron. Activity silent, like, is like complete nuts. So I don't think it's like that. I think it's so. For those who might not be aware, uh, I think Lewis Peacock, and especially people associated with Brad Postel, but uh, I think also you have Stokes and Sprague more recently uh, in Neuron have shown that representation. So if you're giving people you have to you have to ask people to maintain two modality to sync representation. So it might be the orientations of a line and a word, right? And then they'll be asked to do two tasks where they have to basically compare it to a new stimuli and decide if it's sufficiently similar or different based on whatever rules. So the slants might be like it has to, you know, they, they have to both still be um, acute and they can't be, you know, obtuse or whatever and the word like if it's think then it has to be ponder and you know if it's sufficiently similar then it matches and you click the match button and match, match. <laughs> it's so bad if you've ever done one of these studies with these kids it's like it's it's torture for i mean you're like oh my god i'm making them do two hours and yeah, I, would, I would hate it but anyhow so in the first cue so what happens is you get them you have to retain them then you get these retro uh, then you get these uh, retro cues right so then it says basically uh, a little arrow will come up, and if it's at the top, that means you have to remember, and we're about to test you on the, the angles. So then we test you on the angles, and then another arrow will come up. Sometimes it'll be at the top, sometimes it won't. If it's at the top, you can test it on the angles again. If it's at the bottom, then you have to go back to the word, bring it up, and remember it. Now, what they do is they track the EEG, fMRI, all these other methodologies that are standard in, neuros in neuroimaging, how the representation is treated of those two separate representations. And what they find is that, so after the first cue, so you're cued on the lines, that representation is, is, um, is basically very high, and the other one drops off. So it goes back to baseline. Then, simultaneously, what happens is if, if it's cued again, you know, you're successful in performance. But if the second one is cued on the, uh, the one that you weren't, the, that one that the activity dropped down to baseline, and I'll t explain how they do baseline later. Uh, if the word is cued as a second cue, then the activity comes back up and you're able to perform basically as if it was cued first. And what I mean by baseline is when you get the second cue, so let's say that you get the, you get the, the angles cued and then the angles are cued again, you basically forget the, the, the word, right? And so that's the baseline that they're establishing. It looks exactly like if they just had forgotten it in the end. So somehow this representation, which looks like if you just discarded it, comes back alive. And their explanation for this is that there are sub-threshold population dynamics that keep that representation alive. And Stokes is the one who came up with the word activity silent, and I think it's terrible. It's more like... Lewis and Peacock started with this notion of unattended and attended, but I think that's bad too because attention. We, if you if you think working memory is bad, man. Yeah, attention's worse. Attention is like, <laughs> whoa, that's like, good luck. Uh, I like I kind of like Wayne Wu's version, but like anyhow, we can talk about that later. Um, so yeah, it's it's just like these sub threshold population dynamics are what's keeping it alive. What does that mean? That means it is active. It's just not something we can detect. And basically, what I think about this is I think. Uh, two things. One is that these subthreshold dynamics may be things like calcium kinetics, maybe things like short-term changes in the synapses and dendritic pruning, things that happen. The things that happen also that we see with uh, more clear phenomena, things like long-term potentiation and so forth, and learning and memory consolidation. But it turns out that those dynamics might be happening right. in the short term. And that means that somehow this kind of working memory, if we want to call it that, this ability to maintain information is actually contiguous more with that kind of mechanism than the one that's this kind of active neuronal action potential spiking model that we've had before. So that means there might be two routes to maintain information. And I think that that's probably the best test case that shows us like, wait, maintenance isn't a single 
mechanism in the brain. There might be many ways to keep a representation alive in the brain. I think this, the second consequence that we have to be careful of is that it shows that there might be type two errors in neuroimaging, which is like a duh, but you yeah. know, we have to be very <laughs> conscious of this. If we're pricing into our theories, notions of activation, because if we're pricing into our theories, these notions of activation, and we're re referencing activation in this kind of methodologically specific way, then we might be ignoring the fact that turns out like the brain is, all, you know, it's not this 10% metaphor. It's all active all the time, you know? So it, it, that might be the wrong word to use when we're kind of crafting these theories. Um, and also, it, just because you didn't find activation in a given brain region doesn't mean it's not doing anything. Right. I mean, that's an, that seems trivially obvious, but I think mm. that's something that we need to pay attention about. Yeah, no, it's, it's, uh, it, that's a real danger. That's a real danger. That, I mean, I'm almost getting distracted by you bringing up this 10% metaphor, which I want to just scream about, but uh, let's, let's, let's ignore that. Um, so, I mean, the activity silence stuff is to get back on this kind of thread here is important for you because what you think it shows is that there's another model or a possible another model for how maintenance and manipulation could occur. Um, but it's more about maintenance rather than manipulation. Right. And that's why I have to like at the beginning of the dissertation be like maintenance is a proper kind of manipulation and then basically kind of fuzzy that distinction. Um, and uh, it, it is, it is clear. My, my, guess and this is i don't have the, the the neuroimaging to prove it but i'm sure there are much cleverer people than me that can that when we figure out what these subthreshold population dynamics are we will be able to see that like the kind of thing that happens in like memory like long-term memory where things these kind of uh more morphological ways to maintain information a change over time that might be a kind of way to manipulate it i think the thing that gets people on manipulation is something that was explicit in early models. So this voluntary control. Right. It was really, right. it was part of, it was voluntary control and the seed of consciousness. Both those things come up and up and up in the Atkinson and Schifrin model. The association with consciousness has continued to the present, but voluntariness dropped out. Yeah, that's out. And, <laughs> and so for pretty obvious reasons, because we're trying to find the explanation for voluntary, like agency and thought, all these things are very big and we don't want to price them in at that level. So I think, that's the man manipulation now is kind of a code phrase for like this kind of voluntary, you know, I'm really doing it myself activity. And I think that I, we need to challenge ourselves to think about like, okay, what would a real, what, how do we really cash that out in a testable way? Like it's, it's tough. I don't have the solution because I mean, that would basically be having a solution for how we, find agency in the brain, which is right. like, That's I think we're a little far <laughs> away from here. So I just yeah. want to be able to have the flexibility to say like, look, if these morphological mechanisms can create, if what we mean by maintenance is like changing of a representation in terms of its content, then look, these mechanisms do it trivially insofar as they do it when we like misremember things down the road. And Felipe de Brigard has a lot of really cool stuff on how Remembering is actually a prescriptive, uh, future full, future looking phenomena, and I think that's that could be kind of manipulation too. So I'm not super worried about it in a way. Huh? Yeah, that's interesting. I, um, well, uh, let me let me press on because I noticed that we're. I don't want to keep you here forever. I know you have another thing that's <laughs> coming on. I could talk to you forever. I know it's like a really good conversation. But I, so I'm I'm wondering. Um, uh, Well, I'm getting bogged down by something that we were just talking about. But I, I wonder, so uh, finally go, moving on to some issues about reportability. Oh, man. That's, that's a whole other can of worms, I know. But man, <laughs> that is, that's, man, that's uh, yeah. <laughs> So here, you, you, um, you, you want to really deny or we put pressure on the link between reportability and consciousness. Um, and, I, and I'm wondering what the motivation for this is. So it, it's not, so subjective report uh, is often touted as the most or the best or the only, or one of those select your favorite um, one uh, check on what's going on with the consciousness of a, of a, a subject. You deny that. Is that right? Or what, what is exactly your beef with reportability? 
So I guess, uh, man, this was like late in the dissertation, and I was kind of seeing this word come up and up and up again as this kind of, you know, it's a kind of evidentiary gold standard for first order theories of consciousness is that they should be able to uh, access consciousness requires that we can report it. You know, this is kind of the minimal blocky in line on these. Yeah. And so the question then becomes like, okay, well, how do you actually devise a test for report? And it turns out when you think about that, and I think Lama makes it very explicit in like a 2007 trends review paper when he's like, this is crazy because depending on what you count as report, you're going to price, you're going to build in your model, all these different higher cognitions. And it can really be, I think at one point he says by that logic, you know, the whole, any part of the brain or probably the entire part of all different parts of the brain have already been implicated in consciousness, depending on your realizer of report. And I kind of wanted to be like, man, is this a single thing? Like what unites reportability as like an actual, not quite natural kind, but just like conceptual kind term. Right. And cause like I, people, every time my like MO right now is like, every time people use a concept, I kind of want to do the Josh Nope thing and be like, wait, what are the intuitions behind it? Not necessarily go and like review and interview people, but be like, are the intuitions in the pre, in the pre theoretical assumptions that we have baked into this concept, are they good? And I think with report, we've been relying on this kind of like, well, duh, it's just like, behavior but behavior is a very varied thing and so i was very surprised to look at different cases where um for example and hydroencephalitic children uh uh hydro and encephalitic children so um and children and some other people who have uh, suffered massive brain damage uh who are, who are taken to be able to report about conscious experiences. And I think that when we look at those cases, it actually puts some pressure on the only thing that I think unifies report into a conceptual kind. So I kind of do this little Dinettian thing where I'm like, is report unified by being in its neural bases? Well, no, because trivially, depending on what you count as report, it's going gonna, it's gonna to implicate different regions. Is it unified in a kind of normative way? It's like, Yes, but it turns out that, you know, people are willing to say we can be wrong about what we report because that seems like something you need. Like people can be mistaken. That's, right. that's something you need in these kinds of intentional concepts. And then I'm like, well, I think the only thing that really unifies report as a concept that's useful in the first, uh, first order theories of consciousness is that it's really closely tied to consciousness itself. It's like the it, it, we, we hook it up to... Uh, so even implicitly to subjective experience in a really tight way. So what I mean by that is, even if we're wrong about what we report, and this is Dehan and Na, 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 I can't pronounce his last name, Nahashe, uh, <laughs> Nahashe's view, um, we may be wrong about what we report, but even that report, as they say, is not a cut and copy or cut and paste scene, uh, a, a cut and paste copy of a visual scene. It is a, itself a conscious comment. It's a comment, uh, right? It's a yeah. conscious comment. So even if we're wrong about what we're reporting, that wrong report is still itself. It's it's conscious, and so that's why you can tie it to consciousness because report is conscious, right? So it's this kind of deep, deep, deep uh, uh, connection that I think is, is at the concept of reportability and why it's often used in first order theory. So. Uh, what's interesting then is if you look at the cases on the periphery. So I remember in February there came out this case about uh, Jai McMath, who was this uh, young black woman who was going in for routine tonsillectomy, and it just—it's a really tragic story that deals a lot with like inequality in medical services and like uh, embedded racism in like the in medical practice. But basically, she never came out of the surgery. She had to be put on a ventilator. After a few days, she was declared dead. And her family think or are convinced that she's still alive and had petitioned. And it's, it's a dramatically heartbreaking story. But they actually brought in a lot of these neurologists who had been more skeptical of the previous uh, orthodoxy of brain death. And they do these kind of mini studies where they show like, oh, her heart rate uh, increases when she hears her mom's voice as opposed to other voices. She actually started um, uh, 
showing signs of electrical activity after enough time. It wasn't like her brain was a soup. She just didn't have the uh, diencephalon. She didn't have like her brainstem and thalamus and these lower base structures that we think are very important for information processing. Um, she could signal, like her mom would ask you, what's the fuck you finger? And she would like kind of flick her middle finger. In a way, they recorded this enough times and people are like, maybe there is, like, this is a conscious comment. Now, okay, you might be skeptical, but the hand is willing to say that the vegetative state patients that have been uh, interviewed in Owen and other earlier studies where these vegetative locked-in patients, they ask them... Um, Imagine playing tennis. Is that Imagine that? playing tennis or going through your room. And in fact, in I think there's a Monty study. It was a follow-up where they do this with 52 patients, identify the ones that can answer yes or no questions by imagining playing tennis or going through their room. And then a few of them, I think very few of them, like five, were able to answer autobiographical questions at a high rate of accuracy, like 80% or higher. And those people actually managed to recover. So here it is that we're taking – they're not even saying anything. They're not doing, they're not flicking nothing. It's like, they're just, we see some brain blobs you know, on the fMRI screen. And we're taking that as a conscious comment on an inner mental representation. And I'm saying, if we're willing to do that, we need to be more sensitive about people who might be flicking their fingers. So, but Jai, cool. Now, to finalize it, compare it to a case of hydroencephaly, where a child basically, due to many factors, it's really hor horrifically tragic, but basically their cerebral cortex, the, the, the neocortex, fails to develop. Right. So they're left with basically a brainstem, maybe some diencephalon, maybe some thalamus. So all the things that global, the frontal parietal networks, working memory, all this stuff is all in the neocortex primarily. And they don't have, they don't have that. They don't have most of the limbic system at all. Right. Yet, a lot of these children can display effective responses. They can light up. They have favorite toys. If you give them special, because they have severe motoric limitations, if you give them special switches, they can call out for their favorite toy. They can do, they can re respond in effective ways that in a non, uh, in a child without that condition, we would count as possible report like states. And so now we have to be like, man, if we need to dissociate what we count as report from its strong implication to consciousness, because otherwise we can't make sense of these cases without drastically reframing our theories. So, so yeah, and I agree with all that. I wonder what you would say about someone who wanted to restrict the kind of report that was privileged to verbal report. So well, clearly we have to, I mean, I, I think that there are nonverbal reports um, and the sort of things we're talking about account as an example of them, but uh, I, I would be skeptical that those things are linked to consciousness uh, automatically without a lot of further uh, consideration. But certainly verbal reports should have a special place. If you say, if someone says, do you see it? And you say, yes, I see it. Then that should be an indication uh, that you're consciously experiencing or subjectively aware of it or something like that. So the real skepticism, it seems to me on your, on your part comes from the fact that a lot of these theorists want to count these nonverbal methods as um, indication of access or something, and then want to exclude other versions of it. Is that the real kind of I, I, underlying, or is it even subject a verbal report that you're worried about? I don't know. I mean, I think that that would be probably operationally wise at the moment. I think there's two things that I want to push against. So one is that, uh, so the the problem is if we just include verbal report. I mean, that means that like. People would that count like people pressing buttons and responses to screens? Like no. Okay, so that that basically <laughs> like okay, take, take the hands book out. Like you know that's like okay, we got to start over. Yeah. So I mean that would be I think a big bullet for these guys to bite. Maybe it's the right bullet to go forward if this is actually part of their methodology. I'd have to think a little bit more about that. I want to give them a bit more options. I think the other way to go about it is realizing that uh, report can't. Is, is evidence, but it can't be the only kind of evidence. We need to have theories of, co not just cognition, but we need to be able to be like, what? Like, like maybe this is kind of, I know Lame is like, well, everybody makes fun of him, but at least he's putting a, he's biting a bullet. He's saying recurrent processing. So if we see report and recurrent processing, chances are we, we might be conscious. And that's of course pretty crazy because you could get it all over the place and when you're sleeping and all these ways maybe you're conscious when you're sleeping i don't know there, we need a kind of uh conceptual flexibility even that level and i think another thing that motivates that is 
Yes, the search for this capital P phenomenal variant of consciousness and its neural constituents is important, but we shouldn't just limit ourselves to that. I think when we see children like that, it, there might be a whole, we need a kind of conceptual humility as well, because there might be a lot of different kinds of experiences, ranges of experiences that might count in some way as conscious and that have different instantiations in the brain, have different behavioral uh, realizers and, and so forth. And I think we need to be a little more, we need to have a little more humility right. before we write off some of this stuff. And I think it, it's, a, it's a whole package. Having the conceptual flexibility and the humility kind of lets you able to think about, okay, how, just why we, we want to count some nonverbal reports as reports and, and what might be some a priori ways that we might theorize about what we ought to see. And then, oh, we didn't see that. Okay, so let's move on, you know. And so, yeah, I agree. But I mean, I, I, at the same time, I'd be really cautious about wanting to build theories based on, um, you know, anencephalic children having, you know, smiling when they see their mother or picking a special toy. I don't want to, um, you know, I want to discount that data. I want to be open, like you're saying, to these possibilities. But it, it seems to me that if we're trying to build a theory, um, we should start with the easy cases or the good cases, the, the non-controversial ones. And those seem to me to be based on verbal report. Um, so I, I think a lot of consciousness science should be sort of more beholden to verbal report as the gold standard, um, at least for checking, you know, these sorts of things. Uh, and then we could extend out from there. So that's a more conservative methodology, um, I think. But, uh, you know, I mean, just to bring up one kind of example, you know, um, yes. uh, uh, binocular rivalry when I was a student you know that was the rage Frank Tong and his work was taking over the world and everyone's like this is how you study consciousness you do in binocular rivalry um, and then it seems that we showed that well you could have r rivalry even unconsciously when the subjects mm -hmm. don't report that they're aware of the switches and then you have people saying well now here's an objective measure we don't look for report anymore we look for you know um, eye movements and saccades and heart rates and stuff like that. And then those correlate with the switch of the percept. And now we have an objective measure that's not based on verbal report uh, about what the person is um, subjectively experiencing with the house of the face. But if you really believe that there's unconscious rivalry, then the objective measure doesn't answer the question whether it's conscious or not. You still need the subject saying, I see, I see a house or I see a face um, in order to really know what the data that you're looking at is telling you whether something is conscious there or not. So I, I just don't, uh, for me, I don't really see how we're ever going to get away from verbal report being the, 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 the gold standard. Um, these other things that are called report, I'm happy to call them nonverbal reports, but you know, take blind sight, blind sight patients can press a button to indicate that a thing is there, but they can't verbally report that it's there. But when you or I do it, we can, we can make the verbal report. So it just seems that, that uh, the more reliable, the, the non-skeptical way to go forward is to take verbal report more seriously. I think maybe. And I, 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 so I'm, uh, I'm hesitant to say absolutely yes, but I think the, the, so my, my worry. So my worry would be that how much of what we're detecting is actually just the mechanisms involved in verbal report. So that's kind of what makes me a little nervous because that's not a trivial process. Right. So like actually forming a, a sentence, you know, um, figuring out how those, all the language parsing that goes into it, preparing a motoric response, waiting and like inhibiting yourself before you need to say it, saying it at the right time, dealing with timing, then actually producing it requires like a good chunk of brain structure, right? And maybe we can like, isolate it out but it seems to be the case we would need to isolate verbal reports out we would need to basically create a parrot of somebody and just make them say it right without <laughs> like to really subtract it out. and this this becomes then i think also quite difficult because if we're if consciousness is a bit more elusive and it's a bit more about how things are connected throughout the brain then we're, those things are going to fade out and we're just going to get wow look we have this structure but that structure I'm, i'd be more skeptical of saying that's the consciousness structure, I'd be like, that's all this machinery that's associated with all these complicated things because verbal report is complicated. And I think we can't be trivial about that. It's not something easy. It's even understanding the mechanisms that are involved in that is not, we're not there yet. Right. So maybe, but we have to be conscientious about those worries. And then I think like the blind side thing is interesting because I think the more I think about 
you know, uh, Hakon Lau and Passingham's work on the induced blind sight is like maybe that induced kind of blind sight mechanism plus kind of finding a way to figure out the, you know, how to subtract out the, the, the verbal report and what might be associated with it. Because then we can phase people in and out of the space where they can verbally report. And then we can phase them in and out of, if we can do the, the same thing for verbal report itself, then, then we might be able to isolate kind of a, 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 a real ca candidate, I think. So that's something I think that I hadn't thought about that I think would be pretty cool. And I would love to hear how Kwan would probably be like, no, that's not possible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, that's a different story. Um, I'm, I'm noticing we're creeping up on, on time here. So uh, I want to, um, there's many things we could do, dwell on, but I want to, um, I want to sort of stop being pessimistic uh, and um, and uh, negative. So we, as a lot of the and a lot of and you're pretty open about this. A lot of your work is sort of clearing away this kind of you know um, the, I don't know the confidence and the ease with which people invoke these kinds of uh, things without really doing the conceptual work that I think your work carefully does. So and that's important work, and we don't want to dismiss it. But at the same time, I'm curious about what your more positive views are. So where what what are you excited about in terms of um, something which might be a path towards figuring out a theory of consciousness if it's not uh, this sort of stuff? I, yeah, I don't know. I'm still kind of working through that because I think part of the anxiety of coming from a science background is that, you know, you're like, oh, I'm in philosophy mode. I, I can only do the thing I really know. And, and, and creating positive projects and positive views is actually – it's much harder to do confidently. I mean, that's something that takes some time, but I'm kind of working through what I might want it to be like. I think it's easier for me to, I think the consciousness bit, I need to, I, I need to be humble myself and realize that like, we need to, I need to learn more about higher order theories, socially embedded theories. I think kind of getting more grasp on these things and maybe having that influence my conceptual humility and really kind of considering even cases like this, like having people push back, be like verbal report matters. What might that look like? What might a real test for verbal report and the mechanisms associated with that look like? But I think apart from that, because I, to me, consciousness was a test case where working memory was doing this black boxy work. And I wanted to disabuse people of that. And I think, uh, I don't know if I was successful, but it was a good test case he worked for me. To, now I want to be able to say, okay, what are the other core fundamental properties of the mind that we associate with this kind of central workspace metaphor? And realize that like a lot rides on that. And you know, you have to go a little bit more away from the science. So people like I'm thinking about McDowell and Brandom and yeah, that's pretty far away from the science. Right. Yeah, but you know, it was weird. Like I started my philosophical career reading Brandom, and it's like, oh no, it's coming back. But <laughs> these people who talk about rationality as kind of existing in a particular way and requiring a workspace of ideas in order for us to really be rational agents, we need to. And even if you look at really good people like Philip Corrales's work on on this kind of asatoric theory of, uh, and that's not the right word, the questioning theory of attention and everything. Um, uh, you know, it's just a supposition that like, oh, there's some mechanism in the mind that allows us to consult all our background beliefs at once in order to pick them out, put them in the blackboard. And that's what rationality is. Like everyone has that. We all have the same kind of mechanism. That's why we can trust each other to be rational. And I think going more in this direction to be like, wait, no, that metaphor is the same one that's gotten us in trouble with uh, cognition and consciousness. Maybe I can, we need to like revise those deeper, thicker, epistemic concepts of rationality, of what deliberation is, of what agency is, these things that depend on there being a there there in us that is this controlling central workspace that allows us to consult things and is like the core of rationality and agency in this gravitational center in the mind. I, sorry, I'm talking like Jesse. But, you know, and start critiquing, like, what would deliberation look like if we didn't maintain that people needed to have a specific workspace in the mind to get it done? Is it this case? And I think this is probably the, the truth is that we do have workspaces where we can put things together, but they're ones that we create either with ourselves over time. And this is maybe through kind of scaffolded, embedded in embodied ways. So like writing stuff down or that we create amongst each other 
in time, like really in a deliberation. A deliberation is not this like pure thing that happens. Maybe some people can do it, but mostly it happens when you're arguing with somebody in a room. It's a like yeah. social phenomena. And so I think really kind of relocating a lot of those core concepts of rationality, agency, and thought and cognition in the more social space that respects the fact that we're social creatures. So deliberation is probably something that happens not because we have a workspace in our mind, but because we create workspaces where thoughts from our mind can go and be in a public represented space or, you know, in, even by talking to ourselves, you know, um, in a kind of a Gottskian way, but also things like rationality. Why do we have all these crises and failures of rationality and dual process theory? It's like, it, it turns out that um, maybe it's a case that we're baking too much into the, the individual and what the individual should do. And so right. I don't know, that's kind of the direction I really feel like going. I do want to continue with the, I want to throw my stuff out into the consciousness people, get a sense of like, maybe we can create new ways to kind of parse this language and create new boxologies that are better testable and give scientists the tools that they need conceptually to like, look for these things but i think my goal in the next like 10 20 years is to go for for the big guns you know right so it's, it sounds like a lot of i mean what you're talking about is the whole assumption of methodological solipsism um that we can learn about the mind by uh, studying an individual uh in isolation in the lab what we need to expand that to include and i mean my colleague uh, laguardia would be very happy that you mentioned Vygotsky, which you know no one uh, I guess at the Graduate Center, actually, there are some Vygotskians, but um, the, the idea that we're social creatures, I think, is really important and overlooked in a lot of theorizing. Um, so I, I think that's very interesting. But uh, you think you're going to get a theory of rationality and consciousness from looking at in, us embedded in our social environments or just that we're going to be able to add some elements to uh, existing I, neural I architecture? Yeah, I think it's about actually reframing some of the vocabulary that we've used that not to get into the super intense phrase way to phrase it, but that we've been, you know, kind of using talking about rationality since like Kant. And I mean, I think it really is kind of revising that kind of methodological solipsism of rationality that's implicit in the notion of rationality of like, we're all our own little rationally. Don't attack the enlightenment, man. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, what's his name? Jonathan Peterson's going to be angry. Oh, God, don't, don't mention Jordan Peterson. Yeah. Good fucking yeah. Lord. <laughs> I don't expect to be like, I'm going to come up with a non-Kantian theory of rationality. I'm actually really excited working with Lisa because she's an epistemologist. So she's actually, we're on board in a lot of these things. We have a lot of similar ideas about how things are wrong. And so I think I'm not the one who needs to create a framework for that, but relying on other people who have similar skepticisms and worries but also want to be scientists about it and i think right. there is a lot of promise it's just about freeing ourselves from these kinds of preconditions that we may have set without realizing about how the mind works and about how the mind ought to work how the on how mental ontology should look like just because we have as philosophers this desire to see there being this rational checking thing in the in the brain maybe there really isn't maybe that's something that happens discursively and that's okay like, so, so not to open up a th thirtieth thousandth can of worms here, but it sounds like there's a lot of skepticism about folk psychological notions behind what you're saying. So, yeah, uh, is is that accurate to say that you're gonna that you probably tend towards a limitivism about folk psychology? I mean, I don't know. Not in the Churchland way where we're like not talking about. I believe. Uh, there's coffee in the fridge and replacing that with like state B 42. <laughs> like, no, obviously not. I think it's not so much. I'm in a limited vista, but I just want to critique uh, it when it comes into our theory building about rationality, about deliberation, about thought. And I think that's an okay perspective to be because it, it's already our folks. Psychological constructs are already filtered through so much and they're filtered through, I don't think they're universal. I don't think they've, some of them are, like belief and desire probably. But a lot of the way we might think about thought, rationality, deliberation, decision-making, those things are in culture. Those things change over time. And I think you can see that in the progression of, progression of philosophy over the last, since Aristotle, basically. And I 
think that we need to realize that sometimes we've imported weird stuff into that and we need to be willing to free ourselves from that, not just to create a more ableistic, less ableistic kind of structure of like what cognition or consciousness might look like, but also, I don't know, I think I'm not motivated a lot by claims of human uniqueness. So like I, every time I sense something there, I get pretty skeptical. And I think a lot of these things that we're talking about, thought, rationality, agency, these have a lot of that human uniqueness built into them and in a way that makes me uncomfortable and uh, makes me want to be critical of those concepts because I don't think we've proven, like without begging the question, these, these facts necessarily. Yeah. Like, yes, we're uniquely, like, terrible, I think. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, we're social creatures. We're weird. We do weird things. Deliberation. And, I, you know, like, Tad Zavisky has this whole theory of deliberation. I mean, these are not new ideas. I just want to reference that I think what's dangerous is by importing certain psychological constructs and using them and substituting them in to our philosophical theorizing just because they're hot and in psychology is not going to solve these bigger problems that lie underneath the surface that we've been dealing with for years. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, there's a lot I want to continue talking to you, but I can't, we got to end at some point. So I'm wondering, is there anything that hasn't come up, which you want to talk about or mention before we close and sign off? And the answer can be no, but <laughs> no, I mean, I think it's been a lot of fun. I mean, to me, it's just, I want people because I find that people, when I present this, especially scientists get like, they're like, what, like, how is this? What is this guy talking about? What is he on about? How can he believe that there's no working memory? And so it's like, of course we can think, but I want people to take a moment and pause. And if they do feel that way, if they do, because I think the, one of the hardest things for me to do was to, I felt like this would never get taken seriously by psychologists or philosophers in part piece philosophers would be like, that's psychology and psychologists would be like, that's not, that's ridiculous. You're not giving me an experiment. And I think it wasn't until, and it was ter terribly difficult to get published in this kind of stuff until Carruthers got his book out. And then he kind of wet people's appetite and made people realize this, there were philosophical things to discuss here. And I think, so if people have that reaction that they're like, this is crazy. This is nuts. I just want them to, and, you know, not to use ableist language, but I just want them to take a step back and be like, wait, what, what am I really committed to? What, what rides on this, my view about cognition being right? And if they explain that, and I mean, I'd love to hear it because I think that's, there's something in there that is priced into the commitment that we have to these views in the first place. And to okay. be okay with crazy people like me who are going to say no. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. I think that they, that's exactly right. They should pay more attention. I mean, you know, if there's an argument there, it should be addressed. That's always been my view, whether you agree with it or not, whether you think it's beyond the pale. Um, you know, a lot of this had to do with the data. So I think a lot of this um, is going to be played out with what kind of data we have, but also designing better experiments and being more open to uh, new kinds of approaches. Um, uh, it's amazing how kind of dogmatic scientists and science itself can be, you know. So I think it's good to have people like you out there doing what you're doing. I'm certainly going to be looking for your future published work. I think it's going to, we're going to see great things from you. So um, I just want to thank you for joining me today. This is a great conversation. Uh, it's been a lot of fun, and I hope I'll talk to you again soon. Definitely, Richard. Thank yeah, you for so, the invitation. No, my pleasure. So hang on just a second. I'll talk to you afterwards briefly, but. Uh, sure. Okay. Green room.